Joining us now is Dr. Tamara Taddy, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at Yale University, and Dr. Massimo Colombo, Professor of Medicine at the University of Milan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Your session is on liver cancer, pathogenesis, and treatment. Can you give us a brief overview of the session? Sure. We have six papers in the session. Uh, the first two papers look at um, metformin and continuation of metformin after diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma. And both papers, although in small cohorts, show some survival benefit to the continuation of that drug, so some role of chemo prevention perhaps with metformin. Um, there are two papers looking at immunotherapies for a hepatocellular carcinoma, one that looks at host defense peptides in a mouse model, uh, the other that looks at uh, anti-AFP peptides in humans. Again, small studies, but very promising. Um, and then we have one study that looks at the epidemiology of um, uh, HCC in Hawaii and the changing epidemiology, looking at more cases of NASH um, and perhaps uh, you know, less of a role of AFP um, in those patients. And then finally, there is a paper that looks at a single nucleotide polymorphism um, in uh, a, a gene called PNPLA3 that's been associated with NASH, and perhaps this particular polymorphism uh, carries a higher risk of developing HCC. Dr. Colombo, you want to add to that? No, we are, um, in, at least in, in, in Europe, we are wondering whether uh, you know, chemo prevention of liver cancer can be carried out using this drug. There is soft data so far, so I'm anxious to to, to, to look at the data provided by these two presentations, actually. Yeah, well, there are um, other papers that look at the role of immunotherapies. So there's one paper that looks at um, post-defense peptides, uh, and that paper is uh, looking actually in a, a rodent model uh, out of Oslo, mm -hmm. uh, Norway, um, which uh, shows some promise that um, we may be able to use immunotherapy as a treatment against hepatocellular carcinoma. Another study actually looks at um, uh, anti-AFP peptides. Uh, that study's from Japan, uh, conducted in humans. Uh, so this, these studies, although early studies, one in a, in a rodent model, the other in, in humans, they're very early, but they show promise that immunomodulation in, in liver cancer may be of benefit. Terrific. How is the epidemiology of HCC changing? So that's a good question. I think. Partly it's changing in terms of the trajectory, so I think we have to look at trends in epidemiology. There was a paper in 2011 in the New England Journal by Hashem El-Sarag looking at the United States and um, the fact that we probably won't peak in terms of EPC-related HCC until somewhere around 2020. But at the same time, we have an epidemic of fatty liver disease in the United States, and we're seeing increasing um, uh, HCC related to that etiology. So I think in the future we have to think about what kind of research we need to do in this particular cohort and really what their risk will be and whether their morphology or their time to progression for cancer is different. Um, so those are, are things that we need to look at I think specifically in the states. Um, but I'm hopeful that with the new treatments for hepatitis C that that particular etiology will become less of a, of a factor in hepatocellular carcinoma. Any difference in the European? Uh... Absolutely. In Southern Europe, the incidence rates of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma are steadily declining. In Italy, mm -hmm. we are declining by 10% per year. And this is the result of a very effective campaign against the spread of hepat B, hep C, and alcohol abuse as well. This is not true in Central and Northern Europe, where epidemics of uh, virus-related uh, hepatitis due to risk behaviors have increased the pool of infected population, where also the increase in alcohol abuse has increased the pool of patients with uh, metabolic-related cirrhosis, as you say. And there is some, uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, hints to, 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 to say that uh, also natural-related liver disease might be contributed to a raise uh, in HCC in certain areas of uh, Northern Europe, particularly UK. Is there controversy around screenings? So there is still a lot of controversy, not so much in the liver societies. So if you look at the Asian, European, and American societies, we all advocate for screening, and they're part of our guidelines. Um, but screening has yet to be, um, in fact, it's, the Institute of Medicine has come down against screening. The United States Public Health Services Task Force does not endorse screening. 
Um, even the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which often releases similar guidelines to our society, again, um, has not weighed in on whether people should be screened for liver cancer. Um, so there's a lot of um, work that needs to be done in terms of research that shows that early detection saves lives. Obviously, randomized controlled trials in this arena are very difficult to conduct because most patients don't want to subject themselves to a non-screening arm. Um, I think the other question is, in the future, will we have better biomarkers to screen, um, you know, or is there a way to risk stratify patients? Uh, one of the papers in this session actually looks at a, a SNP, a, a single nucleotide polymorphism in PNPLA3 as perhaps um, showing some evidence of increased risk of HCC. Um, so I think we need to sort of think about screening on several levels, but yes, there is still controversy. And what's the latest in terms of treatment? You mean uh, in, in, in Europe? Well, in Europe there is an argument whether, whether screening for HCC is indeed cost effective. Mm -hmm. And this might relate to the fact that, for instance, for certain etiologies, think about alcohol related, uh, many countries do not screen for HCC, mm -hmm. UK, Norwegian, Sweden, so on and so forth. And also because there is a growing evidence that a significant number of patients with compensate fluorosis due to viral hepatitis or alcohol will die of liver unrelated uh, causes. So this will definitely affect cost effectiveness of screening Absolutely. program. And uh, cost effectiveness does not mean that uh, you are uh, uh, spared money. It means uh, just that you are investing your money in the best possible manner because cost effective uh, uh, intervention, generally speaking, are costly. Think about liver transplantation. Sure. But this notwithstanding, in Italy, as far as I understand, we do screen for liver cancer. We started doing so 20 years ago, and this was shown to greatly affect the outcome of uh, treatment for liver cancer. This notwithstanding, the 30, 40% of patients with an early detected cancer will not undergo uh, radical therapies because, for an, because of a number of reasons. Uh, you know, patients coming of age, having severe comorbidities, or the strategic location of the tumor. So at the end of the study, there is an argument is well founded uh, about cost effectiveness of screening. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, we do screen our patients. Yeah. And the treatments? So the treatments, I think the question is what's next on the horizon. So these two papers looking at immunotherapies are very interesting. We've had other papers come out this year that have looked at um, the effects of immunotherapy. <laughs> Um, right now we're still facing a very deadly cancer um, where we have a lot of sort of local regional um, possibilities uh, and, and one systemic FDA approved agent, but I think we really have to look at um, combining therapies and thinking outside the box. You probably have a lot of insights into that. Yeah, if, I'm, if uh, I may add, uh, in Europe we are following uh, guidelines released by our European Association for the Study of the Liver. And then, let's say the most important, uh, uh, you know, recommendation is to follow, uh, uh, you know, uh, patient stratification as a guideline uh, to choosing the proper treatment modality. You know, removing the cancer in itself is not the business. You have to apply the proper treatment modality according to the stage of the disease. Absolutely. And this will, is likely, to end uh, with the clinical benefit to the patients. Right. Sounds like a lot of great information and from two different perspectives, so it should be a lot for folks to take away from this session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much to you.